Muy buenas tardes, good evening, welcome to the digital channel of Instituto Cervantes Leeds and Manchester. It is a great honor to have you tonight uh, as our, our audience in our third lecture of the series Duende, the International Journeys of Flamenco, in which uh, Professor uh, Carlos van Torengen uh, will help us to understand and enjoy flamenco by deepening the knowledge of it. Uh, flamenco is very difficult art to, to, to uh, not to understand, but rather to define what is flamenco, because the, the, it has a very wide uh, evolution. And that is one of the aims of this series, to, to try to explain what are the peculiarities of flamenco and the different approaches to it. Um, flamenco has evolved from a very popular music, and still is a very popular music, but has been gaining ground and been uh, admitted, we could say, in the most prestigious scenes in opera houses, like uh, where you no know, unthinkable, maybe 100 years ago. And uh, at last stage of this uh, uh, journey to privilege of uh, flamenco is uh, the, the um, was declared intangible heritage of humanity by UNESCO in 2010. As uh, I would like always to mention, it's very important in the evolution of flamenco, the uh, support that was uh, made from uh, the whole generation, the 20s of the last century, when uh, in, uh, in Granada took place the Cante Hondo uh, Festival, with the participation and support of figures, uh, such as figures as uh, Manuel de Falla and Federico García Lorca. From that uh, onwards, as I said, to the opera houses, flamenco is all over in the world. In this series, we have uh, been analyzing with uh, Professor Carlos Fanton uh, again uh, the uh, evolution of flamenco, the presence in Africa, in uh, America. And tonight, uh, we will. Uh, try to understand a new uh, uh, a new um, aspect of flamenco uh, through uh, the analysis of uh, the flamenco in Europe, uh, precisely in the style flamenco artists under the Franco uh, dictatorship. In this third talk, we will discuss the development of flamenco during the Franco dictatorship, a period very important uh, in our history in Spain, in which uh, um, some art, many artists, some very important intellectuals went into exile, and uh, entire whole communities were forced from the dictator to migrate to Northern Europe and other parts of the world. But before I give the floor to uh, Carlos van Torregen, I would like uh, to, to present him, for those who don't know yet him, uh, he is a lecturer in Spanish studies at the University of Manchester. Research, uh, his research deals with uh, issues of, like memory, performance, and music in modern Spanish culture, in particular since the end of the Franco dictatorship. His next book is extensively called Flamenco at the Franco Performance of Memory in the Spanish Transition in which he studies how the multidisciplinary language of flamenco has offered ways to, for artists to voice personal and collective memories of the Franco dictatorship. His previous publications uh, on flamenco have appeared in academic journals, such as the Journal of Spanish Cultural Studies and Studies in Spanish and Latin America Cinema. Uh, Thank you very much, Carlo, for your support. Uh, you are uh, a strategic ally of Instituto Cervantes in our aim to promote the Spanish culture. And I would like also to not to miss this opportunity to announce that next week on the 12th uh, of October, we will be holding another important event in flamenco, again with uh, Carlos Fanton again and uh, uh, professor from the Universidad de Granada, Pedro Ordoñez Slava, they will publicly launch the research project Flamenco at San Franco, New Interdisciplinary Approaches to Performance of Memory in Post-Dictatorial Spain, funded by the Arts and Humanities Research Council. 
In this project between 2021 and 2023, they will create an international body network of scholars and flamenco artists to investigate how personal and collective memories of flamenco, of, oh, sorry, memories of the Franco dictatorship had shaped the musical culture of flamenco. So thank you, Carlos. Thank you to our audience. I hope you will enjoy the, the, this lecture. And uh, you can, of course, put your questions on uh, the chat. We will refer that to, to Carlos after his talk. And uh, the Carlo, Carlos von Torengen, that's the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Muchas gracias y bienvenidos. Thank you very much, Pedro, as always, for your very kind introduction. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Um, thank you very much for, for being here today uh, for this third seminar in the series. Uh, it's been a while ago since we last uh, since, since we last met for the second seminar. So I'll also start by uh, giving a very quick overview of what we did in previous seminars, in case you haven't been able to attend those. Uh, and then I'll move on to explain how um, I'm going to try today to talk about one other aspect of what in this series we're calling the international journeys of flamenco, right? And when we're talking about journeys in this seminar, in, uh, specifically, we're going to be talking about migration um, and also the experience of exile, right? Um, and all of this is related, as Pedro has already said, to, uh, to well, a very important episode in Spain's recent history, the Franco dictatorship. Um, so I'll also give you a very quick overview of some of the key events uh, from the dictatorship that I think are important to understand uh, what I'm going to present today. Uh, and then at the end of the talk, I'll also uh, say a little bit more about a research project that uh, Pedro has already kindly uh, announced and that we will uh, present next week in the Instituto Cervantes uh, in Manchester. Uh, thanks as well, uh, apart from uh, Pedro, uh, for his kind introduction as well to him and to Carlos Pulpillo for uh, giving, for offering this platform uh, to share ideas, research, um, questions, uh, discussion about flamenco. Uh, what we're trying to do is to talk about flamenco in angles that may be uh, a bit experimental. Uh, we're trying to talk about flamenco from an international point of view. Um, also in order to break through some of the traditional stereotypes that flamenco has been associated with, right? So I'm very grateful for this platform here and I'm very much looking forward to uh, discussing any questions or any comments that you may have with you after I finish uh, the talk. So without further ado, let me share my screen with you and... Okay. Yes. Perfect, yes. Great, thanks very much. Okay, so we're going to start let me give you an overview of what we're going to do today. Very briefly, I'll recapitulate some of the topics that we discussed in the previous two seminars. Uh, then I'll move on to give you a very quick overview of the Franco dictatorship, in case you're not familiar with that period. And I'll uh, say a bit more about the experiences of exile and emigration. Um, I'm going to say a bit about the difference, but also the coincidences between those two concepts. Um, when I prepared this talk and when I uh, sent my uh, the summary of what I was going to present today to uh, to Carlos earlier this year, I was thinking about talking a bit more about exile, but then preparing for this talk, I found that it was also important to address the experience of emigration, and I'll explain a bit more about the difference between those two terms in a, in a, in, a, in, a, in uh, on a later slide, because um, I think it's important to be aware of the difference differences there as well, especially when we're talking about flamenco and how. I would say that many flamenco artists did not necessarily go into exile, or maybe they, the word exile is perhaps not the most accurate term to refer uh, or to use when referring to flamenco art. Uh, but emigration, I think, on a wider scale, is a very important term for uh, if we want to understand how flamenco circulated both nationally and internationally during the Franco dictatorship. And I'll try to illustrate some of those ideas by looking at two singers and by looking very briefly uh, at the work of one theater company, a flamenco theater company that combined theater with uh, flamenco dance and flamenco song. Um, and what I'll try to do is to give you very quickly what I'm calling here a centrifugal approach to the work of the two singers that I'm naming here, Jose Menese and Enrique Morente. 
And by centrifugal, I rem I, what I mean is that um, I'm trying to approach the work of these singers um, by looking at the way in which they have circulated, their work has circulated, and how their work has been shaped um, in an international context. Meaning that I'm not only going to look at how José Menezes was important uh, for the work that he did in Spain, but I'm trying to escape from that center, hence the term centrifugal, uh, and try to look at how Menezes' work was important in uh, international context as well. And the same for Enrique Morente. Two Spanish singers who did not go into exile during the uh, Franco dictatorship, who did not migrate to other countries. But nonetheless, I think if we look at their work from this international perspective, uh, that can be very helpful and it can offer new insights into the, the meaningfulness of their, of their singing as well. Um, I'll try to, 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 uh, to, to use a similar approach for a very quick example for, uh, from a flamenco theatre company. And then at the end, I'll say a bit more about the event that will take place next week, which is also related to the aftermath of the Franco dictatorship. So to recapitulate, uh, before the seminar, we did two other seminars in which we looked at the first phases, the first um, historical phases in which flamenco was born, how it emerged, and also how the origins of flamenco have uh, important connections with different continents. So in the first seminar, we looked at uh, the importance of Northern Africa and its different musical traditions, also uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, um, and its impact on uh, the rhythms of flamenco and other, other musical aspects of flamenco. And we also looked at how, uh, especially the contacts between Spain and Northern Africa, and also the musical connections between uh, flamenco and Northern African musical traditions have been used in recent years for different purposes um, as part of the tourism industry, the heritage industry, also as part of initiatives of cultural diplomacy. Um, so we looked at the different ways in which, uh, for different reasons, that connection between Spain and Northern Africa has been given a lot of visibility. We also looked, on the other hand, how there's still a lot of work to be done in order to give more visibility to what the scholar uh, Mira Goldberg calls the blackness of flamenco, which is a rather new topic, and we also talked briefly about, about those connections. Then in the second seminar, we looked at the phenomenon of the cantes de ida y vuelta, the singing styles, the flamenco singing styles that supposedly were developed due to the transatlantic slave trade and also during the colonial era when large parts of Latin America were uh, part of the Spanish empire. Um, we also saw that cantes de ida y vuelta, on the one hand, is not an entirely accurate term. For example, the genre, the palo, the flamenco style of the colombiana, which takes its name, its name from Colombia, but, but with, which what, was not really developed in Colombia. It's basically a style that was developed in Spain by Pepe Marchena, and that takes ingredients from Latin American music, but it doesn't really have anything to do with Colombia. Um, so that is one point. And then on the other hand, we also saw, saw how, according to certain scholars, you could indeed apply the terms cante de ida y vuelta to all flamenco styles, because in essence, Flamenco in its entirety has been shaped by those different connections, the ida y vuelta, to and fro movements between uh, Spain and other countries and other continents. Today, we're going to move on to the 20th century. So we're getting nearer to our present time, right? Um, and we'll do that by looking at, I think, one of the most crucial episodes in Spanish uh, history, especially in uh, recent Spanish history, which is the Franco dictatorship. If you're not familiar, I'll try to give you a very quick overview of this period, a dictatorship that took approximately 40 years, right? Four decades, and that is a very long time. And obviously it is not a very monolithical period. A lot of things happened throughout the Franco dictatorship. So I think it's important to distinguish between things that happened in the 1940s when Spain was an entirely different country than it was or than it would become in the 1960s and 70s. Um, the dictatorship starts right after the end of the Spanish Civil War, 1939, in April 39, and it lasts until 1975 when dictator Francisco Franco dies on the 20th of November of that year. 
And I'd like to distinguish for the purpose of this uh, talk between three different phases within the Franco dictatorship. The first one encompasses the 1940s. And this was a phase in which obviously due to the civil war, uh, Spain as a country was entirely destroyed. The entire infrastructure, the industries were devastated due to the civil war. Um, there was a lot of misery, poverty, hunger, and uh, very fierce repression by the regime of those who sympathized with the Republican army during the, uh, during the civil war, and even of those who sympathized with the Republic before the start of the civil war. So the regime repressed, persecuted, uh, detained, killed many people, even um, in retrospect that were associated with or had sympathized with the Second Republic before the start of the Spanish Civil War. So this is a phase where when many people, especially in the poorer regions that are relevant for flamenco, uh, Andalusia, the poor south, the poor rural areas in Andalusia, were living um, in complete misery and many people uh, really suffering from hunger uh, and often starving in the streets before because of a lack of food, right? So this was a very, very complex decade for many parts of, 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 Spanish, um, of Spanish society. And in the 1950s, things started to change slightly. Uh, Spain was also very isolated during the 1940s because surprisingly, perhaps the Franco regime decided that it wanted to rebuild its economy on its own without relying on foreign trade so this was the 1940s were a phase of autarky where uh, the regime tried to be economically self-sufficient. Uh, it turned out that that was not a very successful strategy. And in the 1950s, then Spain started to rebuild some of its diplomatic and economic relationships with other parts of the international community. And there's an important fact here, the year 1953, where Spain, uh, Francoist Spain, right? Um, it hadn't benefited from the Marshall aid that was offered, the Marshall plan, right, that was offered by the United States to help rebuild different European countries in the aftermath of the Second World War. So Spain did not benefit from that aid, but it um, was able to pact another, to seal another pact with the United States, which was called the Pactos de Madrid, uh, which were sealed in 1953, where the US offered economic aid to Spain in return for the possibility to construct, to build a series of military bases on Spanish soil uh, in order to combat, to fight communism, mostly, right? So this is a period when the US started building uh, mainly four bases, three uh, um, um, uh, air bases and one uh, naval base uh, in Morón de la Frontera, in Rota, in the Cádiz province, right? then also in Torrejón de Ardoz, which is near to Madrid, and in Zaragoza. And interestingly, and this has been studied by my colleague, Pedro Ordóñez, um, it was in those very same years that there is a surge in the flamenco industry, or what previously was not really an industry yet. Um, there was a start, a certain start of a flamenco industry, because all sorts of festivals were created, and also new tablaos, flamenco venues, right? Were, uh, were, were, were created. Uh, a very famous one shown here on the picture on the right in the middle, the Tablao Zambra, which opened in 1954, which is only one year after the Pactos de Madrid were sealed, right? And, and a very important part of the uh, clientele of this Tablao Zambra were precisely uh, the American soldiers that were based at the bases in uh, Torrejón de Ardoz, right? So we can see how there is a connection here between, on the one hand, Spain's economic development during this period, and then the start of what we could call uh, a flamenco industry with new tablaos, new festivals, and so on. Um, so I think it's quite important to be aware of how the US military, basically, have had quite an important impact on the development of flamenco as an industry. And this would continue in later years in the 1960s as well, when in the late 1960s, some aspects of the international hippie movement start reaching Spain as well. 
many recordings of the music that was made in those years by Pink Floyd, Led Zeppelin and other groups um, reached young people in Spanish society precisely because of the American soldiers that were based at Moron, at Rota and other bases, right? And that had access to that music um, at home and could bring tape recordings to uh, when they would go out on a weekend to Seville, for example. So the interesting connections here between um, these uh, military bases and the development of flamenco and of other cultural developments in Spain in these, in these decades. Now, the economic development of Spain took real shape or it took, uh, it, it, it took uh, a good kind of pulse in the 1960s when, uh, due to a series of other developments, new ministers in the Franco regime that were appointed, the Spanish industry were expanded, new trade relations were established with the international community, new opportunities for foreign investment were attracted to Spain as well. And this, all of this caused a lot of um, uh, innovations also in Spanish society at large, new forms of cultural exchange. The tourism industry was developed and saw a significant increase in the number of tourists that arrived, that went to Spain in those years. Um, a very successful tourism campaign that was designed by Minister uh, Manuel Fraga Iribarne, who used the slogan or coined the slogan, Spain is different, as can be seen here on these posters in the lower right corner. All of this caused important developments in Spanish society. Now, the 1960s are also the years when, on the one hand, fierce repression continued to exist. Repression of the Spanish population was very harsh until the very final years of the Franco dictatorship. But the late 1960s also um, are a time when um, some forms of political opposition start to emerge on a slightly wider scale than have been the case in previous uh, decades. So the late 1960s is when, also due to the influences of the hippie culture, hippie movement, uh, the student movements, right, in Paris, in Mexico, and other parts of the world, in Berkeley, um, all of this shaped the emergence of some cautious form of uh, opposition to the regime through culture and by cultural actors, artists, singers, and so on. And the two singers that uh, we're going to talk about later, Enrique Morente and Jose Manese, both of them in different ways were part of this emergence of new countercultural tendencies in the late 1960s. Interesting, what I wanted to mention here as well about the 1950s and 60s is that the development of flamenco, as I just said, on the one hand was shaped by uh, the arrival of American soldiers, right? Uh, new military bases in different parts of Spain. But I think there are other ways in which um, other countries, the outside, if you like, um, has had very important and very important uh, role in the development of flamenco culture in Spain as well. On the one hand, the regime, the Franco regime, took a lot of pride uh, from flamenco and it used flamenco as well and other forms of Spanish folklore in order to market and to promote a very folkloric, exotic kind of image for foreign visitors, right? So flamenco became part of what a left-wing journalist, Paco Almazan, has called nacional flamenquismo. The official ideology of the Franco regime was national Catholicism, uh, Catholicism nacional catolicismo, right? So strong nationalism combined with uh, a series of moral values that were strongly rooted, very strongly rooted, in the Catholic faith. Now, uh, as a word play on this term, uh, Paco Almazan, this journalist, coined the term nacional flamenquismo, also to refer to how flamenco was co-opted by the Franco regime and used for strategic and uh, diplomatic purposes. Um, interestingly, there are other um, uh, initiatives from the outside, from other countries and scholars from other other places, um, that even if the Franco regime wanted to associate Spain with Spanish identity, I think the examples here illustrate that Sp uh, the flamenco uh, was also important from people, for people from other countries, right? And it was not necessarily only rooted in Spanish identity at this time. A very important example here is a series of vinyl recordings uh, that were made by a, a French company 
led by uh, an, an engineer called Roger Wild, uh, who worked for the company Ducreté Thomson. And in 1954, that company in France uh, released a series, uh, an anthology of a flamenco song called, called here the Anthologie du Cante Flamenco, right? And the musicians that had collaborated in the series of vinyls, uh, most of them came precisely from the uh, Tabla Alfambra based in Madrid under the, the leadership. Uh, all of this was coordinate, coordinated by the guitarist Perico El Lunar, who was also the regular guitarist at the Thambra Tabla. So interesting how it is in France that a company decides to record a, uh, well, the first real um, large scale anthology of flamenco song. And this was part of a wider musical development that took place in those years all over the globe. And this has been documented in more detail by Michael Denning in his study. I've put uh, the cover of that book on the slide here, Noise Uprising, the audio politics of a world musical revolution. And Denning describes how in the 1950s, in the aftermath of the Second World War, uh, all, all over the globe, there was a renewed interest for folkloric musical cultures and how um, recording initiatives or uh, attempts at projects that remastered previous recordings, how these initiatives emerged all over the globe. And this particular initiative in France is also definitely part of that wider tendency. The second example that I wanted to give here of someone from the outside that became interested in flamenco and really had an impact on the development of flamenco was the, uh, the, uh, the Argentinian scholar Anselmo González Climent, who was born in Argentina, but his parents were from Spain and both of them moved to Argentina uh, during the Spanish Civil War. Uh, González Climent moved to Spain, uh, traveled to Spain a lot during the Franco dictatorship, and in the 1950s, he uh, uh, um, wrote a book that is called Flamencología, which deals with different aspects of Andalusian culture, also with uh, bullfighting, but also with uh, flamenco, right? And this is a book that was very well received in the official circles of the Franco regime. As you can see on the cover image here, the prologue to this work was written by José María Pemán, who was a poet who was very close to the, the Franco regime. Um, and this work and Clement's initiatives in Spain have really helped develop flamenco as an uh, some sort of industry or an autonomous field, which it wasn't really, it didn't really have that status yet in the early 1950s. But when González Climent wrote his work and when the Tablao, the Zambra Tablao opened in 1954, I think that is a moment where flamenco really becomes something more than just um, a musical culture that is shared in smaller venues, it becomes a larger industry in those years as well. The third and final example here, a work uh, written by Georges Hiller, also published in 1954, uh, called Initiation Flamenca, which is a work by uh, Hiller, was a diplomat who traveled to Spain a lot, and he tried to document the singing by some of the more obscure, lesser known artists in small villages in Andalusia and wrote this work about those experiences that he had going in search for those more obscure forms of flamenco song. Um, so all these examples, I think, illustrate that there was a lot of attention for flamenco from the outside, even if the regime itself was very interested in promoting flamenco as being a very strong and intrinsical part of Spanish culture. So I'm trying to look at these ways in which international connections have shaped flamenco culture in this phase as well, even if the Franco dictatorship is presumably a phase when Spain was still very isolated from the rest of the world. Which then brings me to the topic of migration that I'd like to focus the rest of this talk on. Um, migration and exile more, in, in, uh, more, uh, more specifically. So I've spoken about how in the 1950s, some changes took place in Spanish society uh, and how in the 1960s, the Spanish economy really started to uh, boom, how there, was, there were very significant economic developments in the 1960s. This was also a time when many people in Spain decided to migrate, especially people that lived in small villages in rural areas of Andalusia, Extremadura, Murcia, and saw that due to a decline in agriculture, um, that 
in order to make a living, they had to go to work in the cities, to work in the new service sector, the tourism industry, to work in factories, in other industries that had started to develop in those years, in the early 1960s, and already in the late 1950s, actually. Many people from the rural south, including many flamenco artists or many people that were close to flamenco culture, um, didn't have a choice. They had to migrate. They had to leave their rural, their villages, their rural communities behind and go to the city, either to uh, cities in Spain, like Madrid, uh, Barcelona, Bilbao, or they had to go to other places internationally, places such as Paris, um, Amsterdam, Brussels, and other important cities and economic centers in Northern Europe, right? So this is a time when many people move and when forced migration becomes a difficult experience that many people have, have to go through. Forced migration comes with a lot of negative sentiments, as you can imagine. The trauma at times of having to leave behind your community or even your family. Um, homesickness, suffering from discrimination or feeling out of place in new places that you have to go to. So the fact that many people didn't have a choice, I think, had a very important impact as well on uh, on the 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 well the emotional well being if you like of many many of these many of these people and many artists as well many flamenco artists and most flamenco artists that we're going to talk about today uh, experienced some form of displacement either nationally or internationally even the experience of having to migrate from a city like Granada to Madrid or having to migrate from one neighborhood in Granada to another area in Granada that I think comes in itself with very important, uh, a very important emotional process and for many people with very difficult experiences that some of them had to continue dealing with for many decades. So there's a very important emotional aftermath uh, to this time, I think. And all of this is a little bit different from the experience of exile. When we're talking about the Franco dictatorship and when we're talking about exile during the dictatorship, um, in general, we're referring to people that went into exile um, during the Spanish Civil War, right? Or in the immediate aftermath of the Spanish Civil War. So people that went into exile until the end of the 1940s, perhaps, but often people did that already during the Spanish Civil War. Uh, a flamenco guitarist like Sabicas, for example, who had to cross the Pyrenees and had to flee from Spain during the Spanish Civil War, and eventually ended up in New York, for example. Um, there is a slight difference, though, I would say, between these experiences of exile and emigration. Exile, as it is commonly defined, or as we could understand it, is an experience that has to do with, or someone that is an exile, or someone that goes into exile, does that because of a very well-founded fear for persecution at home, right? someone that is afraid that if they stay in their country, then they might be persecuted for different reasons, for their political uh, affiliations or sympathies or for other reasons, right? During the Spanish Civil War, obviously, many people that went into exile did so because they supported the Republic. And many left-wing uh, intellectuals who had supported the Republic went into exile uh, to places such as Mexico, which became the country that uh, received large parts of this exile community from the Spanish Civil War and the Second Republic. I think the profile of people that go into exile and the profile of people that had to migrate during the 1950s and 60s is slightly different, right? People that went into exile did so, I think, mostly because they had strong political affiliations or sympathies or uh, in other forms were afraid that they were going to be persecuted because of who they were or what they thought, right? The emigrant experiences that I'm referring to here, on the other hand, many of those migrants didn't really have a choice and they left um, more quietly, if you like, and didn't really have um, any particular political profile most of the time, but they just had to go in search of economic opportunities to be able to get by, to be able to survive, right? 
And I think that is a that is an important distinction. The socioeconomic profile and also the political profile of people that went into exile on the one hand, and people that went that had to migrate to the cities in Spain or to other northern European countries on the other. And I'd like to focus a little bit more on the experience of migration here, because I think, as I've said, that it's more important for flamenco or that more flamenco artists and communities suffered from this experience of migration because of their, um, their socioeconomic profile, because, but often also because many artists or communities didn't really have very strong or well-pronounced political sympathies. To give you two examples here of different documentary films that deal with that experience of forced migration, there is a documentary film from 1975, uh, which is called La Ciudad es Nuestra, which deals with people that had to move, that were forced to move to Madrid, and that had to start building makeshift housing for themselves, because in order to work in the factories in Madrid, basically there wasn't any housing for them yet. So they had to construct barracks uh, and other makeshift forms of housing, um, which eventually develop, developed into entire shanty towns on the outskirts of Madrid. In the 1960s, real estate developers seized this opportunity and this increased demand for cheap, cheap housing. And real estate developers all over Spain decided to start getting involved in large-scale housing projects that are now known as polígonos de viviendas. So this is a time when there are important urban developments as well. And these two documentary films deal with the struggles that people had to go through when they migrated from the poor south to Madrid and then having to live in barracks, often with very limited sanitary facilities and often having to fight city councils or real estate developers and um, politicians in order to gain access to some very basic facilities like toilets or asphalted streets. As you can see in the image here, the streets in this, this area wasn't even asphalted. Um, so I think it's important to be aware of those experiences as well uh, of many people in the 1950s and 60s. The image on the right is from a documentary film that deals more specifically with flamenco as well, a film by Ricardo Pazzon, very famous pr producer of famous albums by Camarón, Lole Manuel and other artists from the 70s, who released a documentary film that deals with how people from Triana in Seville were forced to move um, and uh, how they were uh, moved to different parts of uh, Seville, to those large-scale housing projects, the polygonos and other areas, and the impact that all of this had on flamenco culture during those years. And these experiences that I've described are also relevant for the two singers that I'd like to discuss, or that I'd like to look at in a bit more detail here. The first one is Enrique Morente from Granada. Uh, Morente uh, is an artist that indeed suffered from those different experiences that I've just described having to do with migration. A singer from Granada, from the Albaicín. If you go to Albaicín in Granada, there's still a plaque somewhere uh, that says that that was the house where Enrique Morente lived for a large part of his life. But when he was younger and when he started his singing career, before doing that, he had to go to Madrid just to try and get by. And he worked many different, did many different jobs, very low paid, suffered from discrimination, from feeling inferior. Um, so these were very hard years that Morente had to go through because, before he could actually start working as a singer. Morente is one of those singers who has been em embraced by countercultural cultures and has been embraced as an icon of uh, someone that tried to uh, voice criticisms of experiences of repression and systemic violence of the dictatorship through his singing, right? And one of the most important works uh, in this regard is a CD, an album that he made in 1971 um, during the Franco dictatorship, right? which is entitled Homenaje Flamenco a Miguel Hernández. Miguel Hernández, a very famous poet from Alicante, who had died in a Francoist prison in 1942, and whose poetry during the entire Franco dictatorship became very important for everybody that opposed, basically, the, the Franco dictatorship, right? So Miguel Hernández in himself is already a very important icon 
of the Francoist opposition. And then in 1971, Morente was also one of the first singers to pay tribute to Miguel Hernández. Later, there would be other singers like uh, Juan Manuel Serrat, an important Catalan singer. Um, Morente's album is, is earlier than Serrat's uh, album, uh, which also pays tribute to Hernández. And interestingly, I think it's instructive if we look at this particular album from this centrifugal perspective. First of all, the first edition of this album was released in Mexico um, by the, uh, a branch of the international company Ispavox. Um, so there are two different editions, uh, editions of the album. The Mexican one, which includes uh, a song that I'll refer to in a second, which is called Aceituneros or Andaluces de Jaén, based on a very famous poem by Miguel Hernández. The Spanish edition did not include that song. It's not very clear why. Uh, it's very likely that this had to do with uh, censorship, that the Francoist regime decided to censor that particular song because of the message to the working class that is uh, voiced by that poem and by that song. But it's not entirely clear what happened there. Uh, but the Mexican edition, the first Mexican edition, does have um, uh, that song included. So Mexico was an important country for the release of this album. Um, secondly, there's a very important, um, or there was a very important um, Mexican theater director, Juan Ibáñez, who was also a good friend of the Spanish film director, Luis Buñuel, a very famous director who also lived in Mexico in exile for uh, a while during the 1950s. And Ibáñez was very receptive to Morente's work and invited Morente to come and sing at his tablao in Mexico City, a tablao called Mata Pecaos. And this experience in Mexico, when uh, Morente traveled to Mexico, according to uh, biography and uh, interviews that Morente has given, was very important for his development as an artist as well. So here again, Mexico was important for Morente and for his work. Um, and then thirdly, the song, the adaptation uh, that Morente did of Hernández's poem um, is also an, an interesting thing to look at from this perspective of migration and the international connections between Morente and other different countries. Um, I'll play a fragment from this song for you, and I'll briefly explain what, what, it, what it is about. Aceituneros, as the title already indicates, right, has to do with those who worked in the olive Grove, uh, groves in uh, mostly in southern Spain, right? Um, the aceituneros, the day workers, very poor, often hired by very powerful landowners uh, and fiercely repressed as well by those landowners. Um, these aceituneros, the poem that Hernandez writes about them, is in a way a call to action or it wants to appeal to the class consciousness of these poor workers of the olive groves and it wants to make those workers see that essentially it is them that own, that have ownership over the olive groves and not the, 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 the powerful and the rich landowners. I'll play, play a fragment from the song for you that deals precisely with that experience. So in these verses, the poem, it addresses the, the, the workers directly, and it says, Andal, uh, Andaluces de Jaén, uh, decidme a mí en el alma, quién 
um, ¿quién, tiene, um, uh, uh, ¿quién tiene propiedad sobre los olivos, um, aceituneros altivos? It tries to explain to those workers, it tries to appeal to their class consciousness, saying it is you that own these olive groves, not the powerful landowners, aceituneros altivos. So it appeals to their pride as well. They should take pride in this, in this ownership, this moral ownership over their work and over the land that they are working. Now, this song, uh, Morente used to perform this in front of many different audiences, both nationally and internationally. Um, a friend and also flamenco guitarist and scholar, Humberto Wilkes, he gave me access to a couple of recordings that were made live at different venues. And it's interesting to see that when Morente performed this song in Jaén, in front of an audience that obviously felt very, um, very near to, to this poem, right? Andaluces de Jaén, that people would indeed shout after each, after each stanza and it would really, it would appeal to their strength and to their pride as well as a class and uh, as uh, workers that were often opposed to the Francoist dictatorship as well. What I wanted to mention here as well is that Morente, he would perform many different variations on this song. He would not only repeat this song uh, and repeat the poem in the exact same way in which it was written, but he also wrote and performed a, a variation on the lyrics of Miguel Hernández's poem. And one variation, unfortunately, I don't have a recording of this. I'm not sure if there are recordings of this, but one variation um, on the same stanza that I just played for you says, Emigrantes andaluces, lástima que un, tre un tren nos lleve, ¿quién nos pudiera esconder entre olivaritos verdes? Spanish emigrants. So now it's not talking about the Andalusians that are based in Jaén. It's not talking only about experiences of repression that take place in Spain, it's talking about the experience of mi migration. The Spanish workers that couldn't stay in Jaén or any other place for that matter, but that had to go abroad. And the lyrics then appeal to those people and it they register the absence of those workers and the shame of the fact that those workers are now somewhere else, right? And I think this is quite a unique example where Morentes, one of the first singers, really started to use the lyrics to appeal to those to talk about, to voice these experiences of migration that many people from Andalusia had uh, gone through in previous years and previous decades. So again, unfortunately, I can't play a recording of this song for you, a performance of this song by Morente, but it is known that he would use the variation, uh, this variation on the, on the lyrics on, on the original poem. There's another recording uh, which has become fairly famous, uh, a live recording of Morente performing the same poem in Amsterdam. Uh, this is a vinyl which is called En Vivo. Uh, there he changes the rhythm of the song, he changes the melody, but the lyrics are the same. So unfortunately, there's no real, there are no real traces of moments where Morente may have performed this lyric. But again, it is known that he would use these, this variation here about migration. Moving on to the second singer, José Menese, who also became a very important icon of flamenco singers, him, but also Enrique Morente, Mare, Manuel Gerena, and other singers that started to use their lyrics in order to voice criticisms of the Franco regime. Menese did that um, in collaboration with, um, with a painter, Francisco Moreno Galvan, who was who autodidactically basically converted himself into a flamenco lyricist and started, uh, started writing a series of lyrics for Menese that would speak to uh, more recent experiences that Andalusians at that time during the dictatorship uh, were familiar with and could identify themselves with. And this collaboration between the two, uh, Menesse became very famous as a result of this, became perhaps the most famous example of a flamenco singer that was very critical of the regime, celebrated both in Spain and abroad. There's a famous vinyl here recorded in the uh, Olympia Theatre in Paris, where uh, some of the pictures here show how important Menesse and his music were as well, for the exiled communities uh, and other uh, uh, migrant communities 
uh, from Spain that lived in Paris and in other cities as well. So the concert that Manesse gave here in the Olympia Theatre, according to some testimonies, had a real Efecto Llamada, as it's called in Spain. It would attract uh, many people from other parts of Northern Europe would really go to see Manesse live in Paris because of the importance that it uh, had for them to see someone perform all these critical lyrics of the regime, obviously people that were living abroad, but that still had very strong ties to, to Spain and also very strong ties to uh, the anti-Francoist struggle. On the picture here, which is part of the vinyl, we see Menesse with the very famous poet Rafael Alberti, who had gone into exile as well. Uh, he lived in Rome most of the time, but also, also often was in Paris. And uh, Alberti even wrote a poem dedicated to Menesse in which he talks about these experiences of his exile, of memory, of nostalgia, of the homesickness, and also the sense of relief that someone that like Menesse gave to him. Listening to someone like Menesse for Alberti and many others was indeed very important in order to, to keep alive some sense of belonging to Spanish culture and to keep alive their hopes as well that the Franco dictatorship would one day come to an end. I'm going to play for you a fragment from perhaps Menesse's most famous song, which was written in collaboration with Francisco Moreno Galvan in 1968. The performance here takes place in Paris in front of an audience of uh, mostly Spanish workers that lived in France. And at the beginning of the recording, Menesse very quickly, he says that this is the song that he usually ended all his concerts in Spain with. And now he's performing this in front of this audience of migrant uh, communities and exiled communities as well. I'll say a little bit more about the lyrics after the song, but you can read along here on the, on the slide. He just said that this is the song that he usually ends his concert in Spain with. Yeah. 
I think we can imagine, right, that when this song was performed in the late 1960s in Spain and also in Paris and other places in front of a large audience of people that had to go into exile during the dictatorship or during the Civil War, uh, people that had to migrate for many different reasons, and the singer all of a sudden performing lyrics that pay that bear witness to those experiences of people that were killed uh, for no specific reason or because of their political sympathies, whose bodies were often left uh, in the ditches next to the roads, right? Um, and people that were often not even trialed properly. All those experiences of systemic violence, repression, that obviously many people were very much aware of that were still very much in their their direct memory, but that people obviously were not allowed to speak about in public, especially inside Spain, right? And then when someone sings lyrics that pay, that bear witness, that pay, bear, that give, that voice these experiences that so many people knew about, um, I think that must have been a very impactful experience, not only because of the way the impact of Manessa's, Manessa's voice in itself, which is of course very, very strong and impactful voice, uh, or because of the fact that this is a combination of a Tona and Martinete, which are both very deep, very impactful flamenco singing styles, right? But also because of the lyrics, obviously. And then the final uh, couple of verses here, that in a way also voice some sort of hope for collective action. Uh, the lyrics, I think, are very ambiguous. They had to be as well, of course, because there was still a censorship apparatus in Spain. So uh, people could not just speak up about anything that they wanted. But here the lyrics very skillfully say or suggest that even if Juan Garcia died without really leave, leaving a trace or a testament, that people in, in, uh, in the village that he lived somehow knew how to arrecoger what he left behind, right? And that can mean many different things. But I think we can also interpret that he left a certain legacy or that what he had done for the village or even just the fact that he was someone that was against the regime, that people knew how to remember all of that uh, in spite of the ongoing repression by the regime. Right. So this is a singer apart from Morente, Manuel Gerena and others that became very important for those different communities, not only in Spain, but also outside of Spain. I'd like to move on finally to theater or companies that used flamenco in combination with theater during the very same years. And their proposals, their artistic proposals are in a way very similar to what Morente and Menessa did in those same years. Um, one of the first the theater companies that used, um, that used a theater play in combination with flamenco in order to voice experiences of repression or memories of experiences of repression was the uh, theater company Teatro Estudio Lebrijano, uh, based in Lebrija, right, in the Seville province. And their first work, Oratorio, which was originally written and created in 1968, the same year as Menezes' Romance de Juan Garcia, uh, is based on the ancient Greek tragedy uh, by Sophocles called Antigone, right? Uh, which is a work that also deals with um, someone that stands up against a tyrant, to put it very briefly and very, very bluntly. And this work became an important source of inspiration for many left-wing artists and many theater companies and the Teatro Estudio Lebrijano among them. Oratorio was created in 1968. It changed over time and very interestingly to see, uh, very interesting to see as well how um, progressively this group started to incorporate experiences from their audiences into the same play. So depending on where they performed it in different locations in Andalusia, in Lebrija, or in other places, uh, the audience often responded very strongly to what they were performing here because it is a play that also had to do with the Francoist repression and victims of that repression, right? So audiences would often, in response, start also voicing their experiences, their memories, and at some point, this company decided to incorporate aspects of those uh, memories and of the audience responses into future stagings of the play. So it is a play that really uh, developed itself throughout those years 
uh, in line with the responses that they got from different audiences. Um, in the year 1971, they also started to incorporate flamenco singing into the play. And uh, they won a very important prize at a, an important theater festival in Nancy in France in that same year, 1971. So I think the acknowledgement for this play came not only from local communities in Southern Spain, but again, also from international artistic uh, circles and industries in other parts of the world, specifically in Northern Europe. Something very similar happened to Quejillo by another company from Seville, La Cuadra, which started performing in 1972. And this is a play that is, has a lot in common with Oratorio. It is a play where the performers also want to deal with experiences of suffering, repression and inequality and migration, uh, but not necessarily by voicing those experiences literally or verbally. So Quejillo is a, the word refers to the cry, right? To El Quejillo, the cry at the beginning of most flamenco styles which is a cry, a wordless cry, a cry that doesn't need necessarily need any words in order to voice certain emotions or certain experiences. And interestingly, this play doesn't really use any words. It tries to use the intensities of the bodies of the singers and the dancers. And many performers that are part of this, this, this play, they try to bring their own bodies to a point of exhaustion or collapse and in that way, by showing these energies and these, this bodily exhaustion, um, is it that they want to show or want to give a sense of experiences of repression and inequality, the repression of the poor Andalusian working class in particular um, during the Franco dictatorship, but also earlier. And I'll give you an example of this, uh, an example of the performance of a Sigiriya, where we can see how the dancer brings his own body to a point of collapse. And Quejillo as well, very important for artistic circles outside of Spain. Uh, and uh, uh, it was premiered actually at an important festival in Paris, the, um, let me get this right, the Theater of Nations Festival in Paris in 1972. This company, like Teatro Estudio Lebrijano, was very successful abroad. Obviously, these companies didn't have as much as many opportunities to stay these to stage these kinds of plays in Spain. Uh, some of those staging stagings were uh, prohibited by the regime, obviously because of the, the the impact and also the the messages, the anti anti regime messages that were voiced by these plays, even if only implicitly. And here's why I think we can see how. These dancers really try to make use of the body in order to speak to certain experiences of repression, not necessarily using any props. As you see, the scenery is very sober, very dark and, and, and austere, right? They don't really use any, any words or any specific references to the regime. But many people that saw this play, obviously, they knew uh, what kind of experiences this, this company was addressing. So. What I've tried to do is give you a very quick overview to some of the um, some of the artists that started doing new things with flamenco in the final years of the Franco dictatorship. Artists that had all experienced different forms of migration nationally or internationally, and that also 
became very important for international communities of Spanish emigrants, Spanish exiles, but also other communities from other, uh, other countries that also were struggling with their own experiences of systemic violence. I think, first of all, what we can see when looking at these different artists and these different companies is that flamenco, during the dictatorship, continued to circulate internationally on a very wide scale. And that international um, contact and international networks were crucial for the development of uh, flamenco culture, even during the dictatorship years. So I think that this international circulation happened on a larger scale than one might expect. Because normally when we think about the Franco dictatorship, we think about a very hermetic regime that didn't really allow for any forms of cultural exchange between Spain and other parts of the world, right? I think that is a bit of a stereotype or an impression that uh, didn't really correspond with, with what happened, especially in the second half of the dictatorship, right? Um, I've tried to show how different flamenco artists that we can't necessarily call exiles for the reasons that I've tried to explain, but flamenco artists that did definitely knew experiences of migration, how their work became very important in what I'm calling networks of transnational solidarity between opponents of dictatorial regimes, uh, both in Europe, but also in Latin America. There are examples uh, of performances that the Teatro Estudio Lebrijano and also La Cuadra did in Latin America in front of audiences that were part of the anti-Pinochet struggle. Or, for example, José Menese, who became very important as well for a painter from Chile who lived exiled in Paris and who was a good friend of Salvador Allende, the socialist president whose government was violently overthrown by Pinochet in Chile, right? Uh, Roberto Mata is the name of that painting. So I think that it's instructive to think of the work of these artists as part of those international networks, not only of migration, but also of solidarity between people that were struggling against different forms of systemic violence uh, on both sides of the Atlantic. And then a third and final point to conclude here, um, I've said that I think it's important to think not only about the experience of exile in relation to the civil war and the dictatorship, but also to address those more invisible uh, experiences of migration of poor people that often did not know or did not, ha did not have really, really have any means to uh, speak out about their experiences. These were not really famous writers or intellectuals that would then go on to write novels or essays or other works about their experience of exile and displacement. There were many artists that were members of very poor immigrant communities that didn't really have a choice, but go abroad and try to get by there. And I think this is something that is still largely absent in cultural histories of the Franco dictatorship and, and histories of uh, the exile movements as well, to talk about those Spanish immigrant communities in Northern Europe and even if they were not professional artists, how they as well contributed to the dissemination and the circulation of flamenco internationally. And I'd like to end on a biographical note here. The picture here in the lower right corner is a picture that was taken in the early 1980s. And uh, uh, the person with the guitar on the right is my father, who um, got to meet different people, uh, Spanish uh, members of a Spanish community that lived in the Netherlands and that had gone to live in the Netherlands, often with very little um, kind of luggage. Often they just had to leave and didn't have a choice but go to, the, to Northern Europe, find a job there. People that worked in fabrics and in other industrial kind of positions. Um, and of course, people that would try to meet up with each other gather to meet up and share some of the experiences that they have, but of course also share the music that they knew, flamenco in this case. Um, my father, who plays guitar, started to meet with these people, became interested in flamenco, and uh, the reason that I'm giving this talk here today in many ways has a lot to do with this picture, obviously. The fact that these people who didn't invite, didn't perhaps leave a verbal testimony about their experiences, but were, and still are, 
very important for the international journeys of flamenco and the international circulation of flamenco. So I, sh I thought I should end on that on that personal note. Um, next week, we're going to continue this discussion, but then we'll look at um, post-dictatorial Spain after the end of the Franco dictatorship and how memories of the dictatorship uh, circulated in the flamenco world and also how different artists used and still are using flamenco as a medium of coming to terms with some of those very different a very difficult experiences that I've that I've spoken about today. Um, it will the 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 event will take place at 6 p.m. UK time. Uh, there will be a surprise musical performance that I'm not going to reveal any details about. Uh, but if you're interested in assisting to that event in attending, then there's still some places left. I think you do need to register because there's limited capacity in the room. Uh, but if you're interested, then uh, you're very welcome to join us. Um, the day after, with Pedro Ordóñez, my colleague from the University of Granada, we will also present this, uh, this project uh, on campus at the University of Manchester, and there will be Zoom connectivity. So if you're based outside of the UK and are interested in attending one of these two events, then you're also very welcome to attend the one on Wednesday. Uh, I'm going to ask Carlos Pulpillo to circulate the Zoom link uh, for that event in case any, any of you is interested in, in attending that. And then finally, uh, the last seminar will take place, the last seminar of this series will take place on the 8th of December, in which we will look at a film, we'll analyze a film uh, that will be screened the week before, La Leyenda del Tiempo, by the Bar uh, filmmaker from Barcelona, Isaac La Cuesta, and there we'll have a chance to look at the relations between flamenco and Japan, and also to draw a couple of general conclusions about this seminar series. So you're also kindly invited to attend that final seminar on 8th December. And I'd like to leave it there. So I'll stop sharing my screen now. Thanks very much for your attention and very happy to take any questions. Thank you, Carlos. It was a wonderful uh, lecture. We have enjoyed a lot and uh, and especially very, the very emotional end also with the story about your father, how you you get to, to be passionate with flamenco as well.